This is the second half of the book of Hosea. This will be chapters 10 through 14. Again, read the chapters before listening to this as I make comments and commentary on the different verses so you'll have the details and the storyline. And I feel that it'll probably make more sense and you'll get more out of it. So with that, let's start with chapter 10. Condemnations and Supplications. This prophecy appears to have been uttered at a late date than the last. There is no longer any mention of Egypt, but the calamity from Assyria seems imminent. Again, Hosea urges them to repent while there is time, and again gives way to despair. So, let's chart with verses 1 through 2. Israel is empty, meaning, empty comes from bakak, luxuriant. It also has the meaning of luxuriant. At this time, Israel was prosperous economically. However, the more he prospered, the more he multiplied his heathen, he, heathenish altars and symbols. He brought forth fruit unto himself, meaning society was focused on themselves and the material things of the world that they could consume upon their lusts. Therefore, their heart is divided. There is no simple worship of Jehovah, but a confused heathenish worship, which God will altogether destroy. Again, as I said in the last presentation, this book is a book for our day. If that does not describe today, I do not know what does. Even some, I hope not many, but some in the church, Israel has become empty because of luxuriousness. They become empty spiritually and inside, and they're <clears throat> focused more upon the heathenistic, or we would say materialistic things of the world, just as Israel was anciently. We know society in general is, and unfortunately that creeps into the church. Verse 3, they have no king because they have not submitted themselves to their natural king, Jehovah, and they realize too late the impotence of him who is a king only in name. Verse 4, they have spoken, meaning mere words not followed by deeds, and sworn falsely to agreements which they have not kept. The reference is probably to their commercial dealings with each other, as in Hosea 4.2. Hemlock in this verse is referring to judgment will come upon them like the rank growth of a noxious weed. Verse five through, verses 5 through 8, because of the calves of Beth-Avon, that phrase means, Beth-Avon in Hebrew means house of vanity or house of idolatry. They have become a herd of idolatry. That's what it means by because of the calves of Beth-Avon. They will be terribly afraid lest their false god idols be taken away. Priests and people alike will mourn for sorrow. There is a fine touch of irony in the suggestion that a god is sent off as a present to King Jerob of Assyria. Samaria is doomed and her king appears like a foaming bubble bursting on the waters. The phrase places also of Avon, Avon meaning iniquity, means Israel's iniquity will be destroyed by the coming conquest of the Assyrians. They will no longer be able to care, take care of their altars of idolatry. They will be grown over with thorns and thistles. In their despair, they would welcome the most violent death. Talking about the mountains falling upon us. The words are quoted by our Lord in his prophecy of destruction of Jerusalem. See Luke 23, 30. Verses 9 through 10. Hosea finds a parallel between the battle of vengeance against the Benjamites in Gibeah, see Judges 20, and the judgment that is coming against Israel. They remain impotent, impotent, non-repentant, hoping that a similar calamity may not overtake them. There may be some delay, but when God's wills, the punishment will come. The phrase bind themselves in their furrows, meaning when they are bound, yoked to their two transgressions, usually explained of the two calves Israel had built to worship God. When the kingdoms divided, 
and you had the southern kingdom of Judah, the northern kingdom of Israel, Jeroboam, the king, built two calves, one in the southern border and one in the northern border. Two golden calves that Israel worshipped, and that's what they're referring to there. Verse 11, Ephraim is like a heifer, accustomed only to the light work of threshing. But both she and Judah must now bear the yoke of a foreign oppressor. The phrase I passed over, I passed over upon her fair neck, meaning a rather curious but forcible way of saying, I have put the yoke upon her neck. It is an instance of the prophetic past describing as done an event only determined by God. The image which follow express the same general thought, the dominion of a foreign power. Verse 12. The metaphor of plowing leads to that of sowing and reaping. Hosea uses it to make another appeal for repentance. In the past, they had devoted themselves to iniquity and were beginning to reap the consequences. Let them now devote themselves to righteousness and they will receive mercy. The phrase, rain righteousness upon you, meaning because of our fallen natures or natural tendency is not righteousness. We need the enabling power of the Savior, His grace, from heaven to be rained down upon us to enable us to yield to the enticings of the Holy Spirit and putteth off the natural man and becometh a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord and becometh as a child submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon him, even as a child does submit to his father." then we can become righteous and receive mercy. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Mercy is not showered indiscriminately upon mankind, except in the general sense that it is manifest in the creation and people of the earth and in the granting of immortality to all men as a free gift. Rather, mercy is granted because of the grace, love, and condescension of God, as it is with all blessings to those who comply with the law upon which its receipt is predicated. The law is the law of righteousness. Those who sow righteousness reap mercy. And righteousness comes through repentance, I would add. Back to his quote. There is no promise of mercy to the wicked. Rather, as stated in the Ten Commandments, the Lord promised to show mercy unto thousands of them that love him and keep his commandments. Probably a great best explanation of mercy. Mercy is not unconditional. It is very conditional. And Brother McConkie just outlines the conditions beautifully. Verse 13 of Hosea 10. The law of the harvest. If one plants or does works of righteousness, he reaps mercy and the blessings of obedience. See Doctrine and Covenants 130, 20-21. If one plants wickedness, he reaps iniquity. What one gets is a result of what one does. That one does is a result of a one puts one's trust. We can trust God or power or friends or money. But what we receive will depend on what we trust. Uh, see the Hosea 8, 7 concerning that also. That is so true. The law of the harvest works spiritually as it does physically. You plant watermelon seeds, you get watermelons, not grapes. You plant the seeds of righteousness, you reap the fruits of righteousness. Joy, happiness, mercy, love. It's all the same. Elder Bernard P. Brockbank counseled college students. If you sow seeds of righteousness, you will harvest righteousness. If you sow thorns and corruption, you will reap thorns and corruptions. A prophet of the Lord said, For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. If you sow weeds of purity, you will harvest purity. If you sow seeds of petting, immorality, and promiscuity, you will harvest destruction of your godlike attributes. If you sow seeds of pure love, you will receive pure love. If you love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, you will reap God's love. If you would obtain celestial glory, you must plant into your heart and character God's heavenly ways. Jesus, is, Jesus admonished in these words, 
For if you will, for if you will that I give unto you a place in the celestial kingdom, you must prepare yourselves by doing the things which I have commanded you and required of you. If you want a celestial life, you will have to plant celestial seeds. Pure religion comes from God. If you want pure religion in your life, you must plant the gospel of Jesus Christ in your heart. Remember, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you think as a celestial being, you will be a celestial being. If you think as a child of God should think, you will be a member of his celestial family. Verses 14 through 15. The fortress manned by their mighty men would be destroyed by the enemy. The phrase as shalman is spoiled, meaning nothing is known of this event, and neither the place nor the, neither the man nor the place can be identified with certainty. But the shack of Beth Jerbel had evidently created a terrible impression of the horrors of war. And so even though we've lost in history the exact context of that phrase, it meant something to them of the horrors of war. In verse 15, the phrase, so shall Bethel do, means, so shall it be done unto you at Bethel, meaning destruction that is coming. Gospel principle from chapter 10. Obtaining mercy from God can only be done through repentance by putting off the natural man through the atonement of Christ. Otherwise, we will be condemned to the justice of God. Hosea chapter 11, the ingratitude of Israel. Jehovah had been like a tender father and a kind master to Israel from the first. Yet had they ever rejected him and turned to idols. He cannot bear the thought of punishing them, but punish them he must. Yet punishment will be tempered with mercy and lead to at last to repentance and deliverance. Him not wanting to punish, but punish he must means he lives by law. God like I said, mercy is only brought about through repentance. You don't repent, then justice must claim its victims. And a part of justice is punishment comes if, if you decide not to repent. So again, we are in complete control whether God punishes us or not. It's not him doing it to us. It's us telling him to do it to us because we used our agency wrong. Chapter 11, verse 1. The phrase, Israel's coming out of Egypt. Matthew saw the emergence of Israel from Egypt as a type or pattern of Jesus coming out of Egypt. You can see that in Matthew 2.15. When the Israelites were humble, God would work miracles with them. See also Hosea 12.13. Verse 2 in chapter 11, it is God who calls, but he calls by the instrumentality of others, Moses and the prophets. The call is the call out of bondage to the service of God. Yet Israel turned to offering sacrifices and burn incense to the false god Baal. 11 verse 13, or 3, Jehovah is here compared to a father teaching his child to walk, being guided by the arm. I healed them phrase means perhaps referring to the following. 1 Nephi 17, 40-41 And he loveth those who will have him to be their God. Behold, he loveth our fathers, and he covenant with them, yea, even Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he remembered the covenants which he had made, wherefore he did bring them out of the land of Egypt. God had led and directed them by the arm. Back to 1 Nephi 17. And he did straighten them in the wilderness with his rod, for they hardened their hearts, yea, even as ye have. And the Lord straightened them because of their iniquities. He sent fiery flying serpents among them. And after they were bitten, he prepared a way that they might be healed. And the labor which they had performed was to look. And because of the simpleness of the way or the easiness of it, there were many. Who perished. So perhaps that event is what Hosea is referring to, that I healed them. I had to strengthen them. I led them. They, they, they turned and they worshiped 
and murmured against me, but I strengthened in the wilderness and I provided a way to heal them if they would just look, but some would not. 11 verse 4, with cords, meaning not with cords used in drawing a beast, which is being broken in, but something more gentle, the kindly discipline needed for winning a man's allegiance. In the evening when work is over, the kind master takes off the yoke, gently passing it over the animal's face, and then gives it food. This is an agricultural simile and refers to the custom of raising the yoke from the neck and cheeks of the oxen so that they can more readily eat their food. Henderson says, Your yoke not only include the piece of wood on the neck but why, by which the animal was fastened to the pole, but also the whole of the harness about the head which was connected with it. The yoke used in the east are very heavy and press so much upon the animals that they are unable to bend their necks. So referring to the yoke and taking off their necks in verse 4, is, that explains that. Compare this statement with what Jesus says about his yoke, Matthew eleven twenty-eight through 30 Remember, his yoke is easy. If you'll come unto me and be yoked with me, your burden shall be light. Chapter 11, verses 5 through 7. Kindness has failed to lead them to repentance. Therefore, they must be purified by punishment. Not to Egypt, however, shall they go, but the Assyrians shall conquer and carry them away. It was evident that Assyria was to be the instrument of God's vengeance. Verse 6. The mention of apostasy produces a severe tone of threatening. His branches refers to his defenses, meaning either his strong cities or his nobles, on whom he depended for safety. But their evil counselors, if we take it in the latter sense, would prove their ruin. In verse 7, though they formally called on God, they did not really exalt them in their hearts. That was part of the problem with Israel and why Hosea is coming to them and Jehovah is warning them. You formally go through the motions, you go to church, you partake of the sacrament, you attend the temple, you do your vis ministry, and you, but your heart has not turned to me. You go through all the right stuff, but you don't have the right motive. Your heart is not in the right place. Chapter 11, verse 8, Hosea's feeling again turns to tenderness. How can the loving father bear to chastise his people as they deserve? Adma Zeboim means with reference to the destruction of the cities of the plain. In uh, you get a JST, see the footnote 8b, you get a JST addition to the end of verse 8 where it says, Mine heart is turned toward thee, and my mercies are extended together thee. That is uh, explains better than what is originally, or what was ended up, what we have now in the King James. To, Jehovah's heart is towards them as mercies are extended if they would just gather. Chapter 11, verse 9. Jehovah's feelings grow stronger still. He will not punish his people immediately. That is why Hosea was preaching to them to warn them. Therefore, Jehovah was more long-suffering and less vindictive than man. See, man, we, we, we just immediately want to punch, boom, and, you know, we get angry and go to your room and da, da, da. If Israel would just repent, Jehovah would spare them. Jehovah in the Old Testament is so merciful. The reason why we read it wrong is because we see times when, he, when because of their agency, punishment has to come. And we think, oh, that's unfair, until we realize, no, they made bad choices. And the fruit of bad choices is you get bad consequences. They chose. I will not enter into the city, meaning he would not destroy them right then. I should be destroy them right then in his anger. He was sending Hosea to warn them. Chapter 11, verses 10 through 11, Hosea appears to suddenly reflect on when the Lord turns his pity towards the people once more. 
they will follow him and hasten with trembling at his voice from the lands of their banishment and be re reinstated by him in their inheritance. So it seems like he all of a sudden is turning now when he, and he sees in the future when Israel will be gathered again and come back into the fold. The phrase to walk after the Lord denotes not only obedience to the gathering voice of the Lord as manifested by their drawing near, but that walking in true obedience to the Lord which follows from conversion. Their faithfulness they will exhibit first of all in practical obedience to the call of the Lord. This call is described as the roaring of a lion. The point of comparing lying simply in the fact that a lion announces its coming by roaring so that the roaring merely indicates a loud, far-reaching call like the trumpet blown, like the blowing of the trumpet in Isaiah 27, 13, in consequence of which the Israelites, as his children, will come trembling from lands of the west as well as from Egypt and Assyria. So you can see him, he's, he's talking about how one day, because the restoration will gather back, they'll hear the sound of the trumpet, the, war, the, the call to come to Zion. Flee Babylon and come to Zion and gather into the true church and the true fold. He, he's seen us in the future that one day that will happen. These three regions are simply a special form of the idea out of all quarters of the globe. We will gather Israel from everywhere. The comparison to birds and doves expressed the swiftness by which they draw near as doves fly to their dovecotes. Then will the Lord cause them to dwell in their houses, that is, settle them once more in their inheritance in his own land. So again, 10 and 11, he now just pivots to seeing the future. And there is hope for Israel, but it will be many, many years from Hosea's day before Israel's gathered again. 11 verse 12. Yet verse 11, a return to Jehovah was not to be for right then. Ephraim has surrounded me with lying, and the house of Israel with deceit, and Judah is moreover unbridled against God and against the faithful Holy One. In the name of Jehovah, the prophet raises a charge against Israel once more. Lying and deceit are the terms which he applies, not so much to the idolatry which they preferred to worship of Jehovah, as to the hypocrisy with which Israel, in spite of its idolatry, claimed to be still the people of Jehovah, pretended to worship Jehovah under the image of a calf, and turned right into wrong. Remember I told you they had those two calves, one on the southern border, one on the northern border, and, and they worshipped those calves, but they worshipped Jehovah through the calves. And thinking this whole time, they're having true forms of worship, even though they made a golden calf to do it. Gospel principle from this chapter, God will extend mercy to us as long as we repent, but justice will come if we persist in wickedness. The kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom, found that out the hard way. Hopefully you and I don't have to, individually. That's what these scriptures are for to show us. Look, here's what happens when you push God to the point where he has no choice but to let consequences come. Because you did not do what is right. Remember? Do what is right. Let the consequences follow. We sing that. Well, let's believe it. Don't do what is right and the consequences will follow is probably a phrase we should have put in that song. Let's turn to chapter 12 now of Hosea, a reproof of commercial dishonesty. Uh, this is interesting. Does this have any parallels to our day? Is there any dishonesty in our material, commercial, financial, or whatever relationships with each other? The prophet returns to the subject of the unfaithfulness both of Israel and of Judah. They have sought help where it was not to be found, and neglected God, the only source of help, and forgiveness of the example of their ancestor, Jacob. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. The winds mentioned in here stands for what is useless and unsatisfying. The east wind was noted for its violent and destructiveness. See Psalms 48, 7 talking about that. 
The meaning, therefore, is to strive eagerly after what is empty or vain, synonymous with radaf, the Hebrew word, to pursue the east wind. In Palestine, a fierce, tempestuous wind, which comes with the burning heat from the desert of Arabia and is very destructive to seeds and plants. It is used, therefore, as a figurative representation, not of vain hopes and ideals that cannot be possibly reached, but of that destruction which Israel is bringing upon itself. The phrase, all the day, meaning, that is, continually, meaning continually, it, it multiplies lying and violence through the sins enumerated in Hosea 4.2, by which the kingdom is being initially broken up. Added to this, there is the seeking for alliances with the powers of the world through Assyrian Egypt, by which it hopes to secure their help, but only brings about its own destruction. See, um, it, Northern Kingdom was trying to make alliance with other countries instead of rely upon Jehovah to be their protector and their guide and, and, and to watch over them. Oil, mentioned in this verse, is taken to Egypt from the land abound, abide, abounding in olives, not as a tribute, but as a present for the purpose of securing an ally in Egypt. This actually took place during the reign of Hosea, who endeavored to liberate himself from the oppression of Assyria by means of a treaty with Egypt. See 2 Kings 17.4. The Lord will repay both kingdoms for such conduct as this. But just as the attitude of Jehovah towards Judah, I'm sorry, towards God is described more mildly than the guilt of Israel in Hosea 11:12, so the punishment of the two is differently described in Hosea 12:2. Jehovah has a trial or controversy with Judah. That is, he has to reprove and punish its sins and transgressions, Hosea 4.1. Upon Jacob, or Israel, of the ten tribes, he has to perform a visitation, that is, to punish it according to its ways and its deeds. Chapter 12, verses 3 through 5. Israelites, as descendants of Jacob, were to strive to imitate the example of their forefather. His striving hard for the birthright and his wrestling with God, in which he conquered by prayer and supplication, are types and pledges of salvation to the tribes of Israel which bear his name. Hosea here regards God's promises to Jacob as made to the people of Israel, whom in fact they chiefly, they chiefly concern. The phrase, and Jehovah is the God of armies, Jehovah is his memorial, refers to the thoughts emphasized are, one, the protective power of God, so that's what that phrase is referring to, and two, his faithfulness. Hosea has probably in his mind Exodus 3.15. Jehovah was the God of the patriarchs who would keep the promises which had made, he had made to them. So that's why Hosea is saying Jehovah is the guard of armies. Jehovah is his memorial. Jacob relied upon Jehovah. And look how he succeeded and wrestled with God and got a promise. You should have done the same. You should have followed the example of your forefather. Verse 6, to this God Israel is now to return. So to return as to enter into vital fellowship with God, that is, to be truly converted. The conversion is to show itself in the perception of love and right towards their brethren. And in contrast, trust in God. But Israel is far removed from this now. This made me think of a talk, and I should have put the quote in here, but I forgot this. I just thought of this now as I read this that the conversion is to show itself in the perception of love and kindness towards his brethren. I believe it was Elder Marky e. Peterson. No, Marvin J. Ashton, who gave a talk in conference and said that a true sign of conversion is in how we treat others. And then he goes on and gives some examples of that and explains that. That is so true whether we're really converted, whether this gospel is really in our hearts, or we just go through the formalities. Remember, that's what they were doing. That's, that was the problem. They never got it into their hearts. It's going to be determined how we treat others and how we, whether we're willing to take care of them and watch over them, bear their burdens, as Mosiah says. 
And as it says here, Israel is far removed from that. Chapter 12, verses 7 through 14. Israel is unjust and unmerciful. In the pursuit of grain and of gain, they are no better than the heathen. Though they pride themselves on their honesty, Jehovah has long warned them. Now he will punish them. Their sanctuaries will be utterly destroyed. So they have not borne the burdens of one another. They have been very unjust and unmerciful to each other just because of material gain. And they lust after the material things of the world. And it reflects in how they treat each other and their brethren. And it's now destroying the church at that time. Chapter 12, verse 7. That was an overall view of 7 through 14. Now here's some specific things. Verse 7 it says the merchants in there should read Canaan in his hand is the scale of cheating. He loves to oppress. That was where the word merchant comes from. It's Canaan, meaning Canaan. Israel is not a Jacob. Israel is not a Jacob who wrestles with God, but it has become Canaan. Israel is now turned into the world, in other words, seeking its advantage in deceit and wrong. Israel is called Canaan here, not so much on account of its attachment to Canaanite idolatry, but to fraudulent weights and the love of oppression or violence. You've got to remember back then, you know, they would weigh out different measures of grain and stuff that you bought, and also they, they, they would be deceptive and they would cheat and make their weights different, either heavier and stuff or lighter so that it cheated the people. They got less amount of product for the money they were giving. Okay. Cause they had fraudulent weights cause they weighed out stuff. That's what he's referring to at this point, not to, th and this points not to their attitude towards God, but to their conduct towards their fellow man, which is, is the very opposite of what, according to the previous verse, verse, the Lord required, mercy, and the very thing which he commanded in the law. Well, what does he command in the law? Leviticus 19.36 says, just balances, just weights, a just ephah, that was a certain amount of weight, and a just hen, that's another certain measure, shall ye have, I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. So in Leviticus, they were told by God, you do not rig the weights and stuff so that you cheat them on how much you're giving them by what they're buying. You have just balances and just weights. They were not doing that. They had learned through the Canaanites that, oh, look, if I adjust the weights a little bit stuff, I can give them less product and I get the same amount of money and that way I have more product I can sell more. I can make more money. Oh my gosh. Hmm. That's kind of similar today with some people and their dishonesty, isn't it? And also in the case of violence, it says in Leviticus 6, 2 through 4, if a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord and lie unto his neighbor in that which was delivered him to keep or in fellowship or in taking away by violence or hath deceived his neighbor or have found that which was lost and lieth concerning it and sweareth falsely in any of these things doth a man doeth a man doth sinning therein. Then it shall be, because he hath sinned and is guilty, that he shall restore that which he took violently away, or the thing which he had deceitfully gotten, or that which was delivered to him, or the lost thing which was found. But no, Israel has turned from that commandment, committing acts of violence, stealing, cheating each other in financial matters and commercial dishonesty, which probably led to actual physical violence, but they're certainly committing commercial violence and they wouldn't repent. Chapter 12, verse 8. Ephraim prides itself upon this unrighteousness. They, they were proud of their righteousness. They celebrated their righteousness in the idea that it has thereby acquired wealth and riches by the use of unjust weights used in measuring. And with the still greater self-deception that with all its acquisition of property, it has committed no wrong. That was sin. That is, they would be followed by punishment. 
So they had justified themselves in this and learned how to get wealthy through deception and being dishonest in commercial dealings and your business dealings. Hmm. Seems like we have a question about that to go to a certain house, to ordinance, before you can get a recommend to go there concerning our business and financial dealings with each other. Those in Israel at the time would not be able to answer that question properly to go to the temple. Chapter 12, verse 9, the Lord met the delusion of the people that they had become great and powerful through their own exertion by reminding them that he has been Israel's God from Egypt forward and that to him they owe all prosperity and good in both past and present. Because they do not recognize this and because they put their trust in unrighteousness rather than in him, he will now cause them to dwell in tents. That's what the word tabernacle means. It means tents. Again, as in the day of the Feast of Tabernacles, meaning they will repeat the suffering as when they were led through the wilderness. Well, you're going to go back through a wilderness. A series is going to come. All because in the pride of your heart, you deceive others and you think you've gotten all your prosperity because of your cunning and intellectual abilities to, to deceive. Well, that's prevalent today. Don't you think the same punishment will come? Chapter 12, verse 10. The moral degradation of the people was not from want of warning from prophets. We have Hosea being one example. They are reminded how the Lord had proved himself to be God of Israel from Egypt onwards by sending prophets a multiplying prophecy to make known his will and gracious counsel to the people and to promote their salvation. Not because the word is something imposed upon a person, but because the inspiration of God came down to the prophets from above. Israel, however, was not allowed itself to be admonished and warned, but has given itself up to sin and idolatry, the punishment of which cannot be delayed. That's what verse 10 is talking about. Chapter 12, verse 11. Gilead and Gilgal represent the two halves of the kingdom of the ten tribes. Gilead, the land to the east of the Jordan, and Gilgal, the territory to the west. As Gilead is called a city, that is a rendezvous, of evildoers in Hosea 6.8, so here it is called worthlessness, vanity, that's what it means in Hebrew, vanity means worthlessness, wickedness, and therefore is to be utterly brought to naught. The desolation or destruction of the altars involves not only the cessation of idolatrous worship, but the dissolution of the kingdom and the banishment of the people out of the land. The sacrifice of oxen was reckoned as a sin on the part of the people, not on account of the animals offer, offer on account of the animals offered, but on account of the unlawful place of sacrifice in temples and altars dedicated to the God Baal. So when he's putting down their sacrificing of oxen, it's not that sacrificial offerings was wrong. I mean, the law of Moses commanded that. It's where they were doing it. They were performing these in temples to Baal. Chapter 12, verse 12, in order to show the people still more impressively what great things the Lord had done for them, the prophet recalls the, light, the flight of Jacob the tribe father to Mesopotamia, and how he was obliged to serve many years there for a wife and to guard cattle. Whereas God had redeemed Israel out of the Egyptian bondage and had faithfully guarded it through a prophet. The flight of Jacob to Aramea and his servitude there are mentioned to point simply to the distress and affliction which Jacob had to endure according to Genesis 29 through 31. So again, he's using the past examples of their forefather Jacob and what he's going through and how God guarded and guided and helped him that Jehovah would do the same today if they'd be faithful like he did to, to Jacob and how he had to flee and how God washed over and helped him and guarded his cattle, if you remember the story of Laban. And so he's trying to get them to remember these examples from their forefathers and their righteousness, but they wouldn't listen. Chapter 12, verse 13, Jacob's flight to Aramea 
where he had to serve is contrasted with the people sprung from Jacob out of Egypt by a prophet, that is, by Moses. So he's, he's beginning to reflect on both of these. The guardian of cattle by Jacob is placed in contrast with the guardian of Israel on the part of God through the prophet Moses. When he led them through the wilderness to Canaan, they were preserved. The object of this is to call to the nation's remembrance the elevation from the lowest condition, which they were to acknowledge with humility every year with the first, when the first fruits were presented before the Lord. For Ephraim had quite forgotten this. See the problem when we forget our past and we don't remember the examples of righteous people before? That's why God gives us the scripture so we don't forget. We forget our past. We forget the lessons. We forget the righteousness of our forefathers. Then we, we will commit them all over again, the sins. They're there to teach us. Chapter 12, verse 14. Instead of thanking the Lord by love and faithful devotion to him, Ephraim, or Israel, had provoked him in the bitterest manner by its sins. In spite of all this kindness, Ephraim had provoked anger, God to great anger. The blood which he has shed shall not be wiped off, but remain in God's eye, a witness of his crime. God will punish him for his reproach, meaning for his scornful contempt of God. A gospel principle from chapter 12, as Israel sought the lust of the flesh through their dishonesty and violence, they were brought to justice and judgment through the destruction of their land by the Assyrians. Brothers and sisters, we're seeing the same conditions today. The dishonesty and violence within our society. What makes you think that in some way or form, we will not go through destruction? We may not have a foreign country come in America, but destruction will come to our society because they are committing the same sins. And we are seeing in different ways different destruction coming. If you just think about illegal immigration and different policies and different stuff and destruction, different things are happening to our society and fentanyl and all of that stuff. We are now seeing some of the fruit of wickedness. Chapter 13, Hosea 13, Israel's idolatry and its consequences. Because Israel would not desist from its idolatry and entirely, for, and entirely forgot the goodness of its God, he, would, God, he, God, would destroy its might and glory. Because it did not acknowledge the Lord as its help, its throne would be annihilated along with its capital. Israel, Israel, Israel's folly has incurred the enmity of God, who has shown himself such a loving friend, but might become a ter so terrible an enemy. Chapter 13, verse 1. The phrase, as Ephraim spake, there was terror, meaning, men listened with fear and trembling. Ephraim was a strong and powerful tribe, which could command obedience, as especially in the days of Joshua. Baal worship was the cause of the national decay in its final doom. Ephraim, that is the tribe of Ephraim, exalted itself in Israel. That is, it raised itself to the government. The prophet has in his mind the attempts made by Ephraim to get the rule among the tribes, which led eventually to the secession of the ten tribes from the royal family of David and the establishment of the kingdom of Israel by the side of that of Judah. So you finally see the breaking up of the two kingdoms. When Ephraim had secured this, when they finally broke, the object of its earnest endeavors, it offered through Baal. It offended, it offended through Baal. They don't thank God for being divided from Judah and stuff. They now turn to Baal worship. That is, not only through the introduction of worship of Baal in the time of Ahab, see 1 Kings 16.31, but even through the establishment of the worship of the calves, remember I talked about that, under Jeroboam, 1 Kings 12.28, through which Jehovah was turned into a Baal. The dying commenced with the introduction of the unlawful worship. Chapter 13, verse 2. From this sin, Ephraim, the people of the ten tribes, the northern kingdom, did not desist. They still continued to sin. 
and make themselves molten images, etc., contrary to the express prohibit, prohib, prohibition in Leviticus 19.4. The phrase, now they sinned more and more, meaning these words are not merely to be understood that they added other idolatrous images in Gilgal and Beersheba to the golden calves, but they also involved their obstinate adherence to the worship and, and idolatrous worship introduced by Jeroboam. So they sin more and more. They just keep going and keep going. Yeah, they keep making idolatrous images and doing that, but they just keep their obstinate adherence to the worship and just stubborn, and their pride, and they just keep celebrating it and keep demanding that it's okay to be like this and God, it's okay if, if I'm pride in, in whatever way I think I am that is natural. I feel this way and I don't know, however you want to put it, they wouldn't humble themselves as children of God under the covenant to keep God's commandments and to have the identity of children of God and that marriage is between man and woman. That gender was before we ever came here decided. That's not fluid. And that having children is within the bonds of marriage. No, they prided themselves that, oh, we're more forward thinking. We, we feel this way, so therefore we identify as this, and God will justify us in our sin. The phrase, men that shall kiss the calves, meaning men kissing calves, it is worship them, worshiping them with kisses. They would actually, part of the worship center, kiss those golden calves. You can see that in 1 Kings 19, 18. Hosea 13, verses 3 through 4, because they would not let their irrational idolatry go. But when you think about that today, Men can be women, women can be men, and just because I identify, talk about an ill, irrational ideology and idolatry. <laughs> Back then, they would not let their irrational idolatry go. Boy, some in our society won't either. They would quickly perish. From Egypt on, Israel has known no other God than Jehovah. That is, has found no other God to be a helper and Savior. Chapter 13, verse 5. Even in the desert, he knew Israel, that is, adopted it in love. To know when applied to God is an attestation of his love and care. That's part of what in Hebrew means to know, an attestation of his love and care. In the wilderness, Jehovah became their friend. He knew them and bade them to know him. The phrase land of great drought, lahav, for drought meaning to thirst, signifying burning heat in which men famish with thirst. See Deuteronomy 8.15 as a little fulfillment of that. They will go through a land of drought in their wilderness wanderings and into the southern part of Israel. Chapter 13, verse 6, but when the prophet in the land of fertility but when they prospered in a land of fertility, they became proud and forgot him. Prosperity made Israel proud so that it forgot its God. <laughs> Any parallels to today? This reproof is taken almost word for word from Deuteronomy 8, 11, which says, Beware, lest thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and statutes, which I command thee this day. He warned them, don't forget me. The phrase answering to their pasture meaning, because they had such good pasture in the land given them by the Lord. And because of that, they became very prosperous. And because they became very prosperous, they forgot the Lord their God and trusted in their riches. The very thing of which Moses warned the people in Deuteronomy 8.11 had come to pass. Therefore are the threats of the law against the rebellious fulfilled upon them. You break the law, you get the consequences. Breaking the law brings destruction. We, our society breaks it today. Prosperous. We are the most prosperous nation in the world. 
And I think by and large, a major part of the Second Amendment Society has forgotten their God, the true God, not all, but many. And to think we will avoid consequence of that is quite naive. Well, concerning prosperity, let me give you two prophets, what they said concerning this idea that destroyed Israel. First is President Ezra Taft Benson. Every generation has its test and its chance to stand and prove itself. Would you like to know of one of our tough tests? So he's t talking about today. What's going to be one of ours? Hear the warning words of President Brigham Young. So he's not going to quote Brigham Young. This is a test for us today in the latter days. Quote, The worst fear I have about this people is that they will get rich in this country, forget God and his people, wax fat, and kick themselves out of the church and go to hell. This people will stand mobbing, robbing, poverty, and all manner of persecution and be true. But my greatest fear is they cannot withstand wealth. That's the end of quote of Brigham Young. Now back to the last part of President Benson. Do you know what peace and prosperity can do to a people? It can put them to sleep. Boy, what a warning. We're seeing the fulfillment of it. When Brigham Young says they'll get fat and wax fat and rich and kick themselves out of the church and go to hell, you can still be in the church and kick yourself out of the gospel. That's what's so deceptive about it. You could be active, whatever the crud that means. You could be active in the sight of people and not be converted to the gospel at all and still be caught up in your lust of the flesh. But hey, I'm active and I do all the outward things. See, that was Israel's problem. That's what Hosea is warning them about. But they had kicked themselves out of the true gospel. Let me give you one more. This is President George Q. Cannon. Listen to what he prophesies and says. But there is something that I dread more than active persecution. We have endured persecutions which have driven us from our homes. Mobs have burned our houses, destroyed our corn, wheat fields, and torn down our fences. Our men have been slain, and in some instances our women, ra women ravished. We have been driven as wild beasts are driven from the inhabitations of men and compelled to flee to the wilderness. We have endured this, and we know that we can endure it and live in the midst of it, for we have been tested." But we have not yet endured prosperity. We have not yet been tested in this crucible, which is one of the severest to which a people can be subjected. We have not been tested with the abundance of property and wealth lavished upon us. And here, my brothers and sisters, is the point against which we have to guard more than all others. For there is more danger today to the Zion of God in the wealth that is pouring into and increasing in the hands of the Latter-day Saints than in all the armies that had ever been mustered against it, or all the mobs that have been formed for the, our overthrow from the organization of the church until today. Now, let me just stop right there. You have to think about what he just said. The worst test than persecution will be prosperity. And you compare what we have now to when he gave this, and we are lavished with wealth. How are we handling it? Back to President Cannon. There is danger not in mines alone. He means like gold mines and silver mines. Not in the increase of strangers in our midst. Not in the seducing influences which attend and presence of some of them. But in the fact that we ourselves are growing wealthy. And that is in... And that is natural for us to become attached to wealth and for the mind of man to be allured by it and by the influence which it brings. There is danger in this, and I look for the same results to follow this condition of affairs that formerly followed mobocracy. 
The mobs came upon us and they cleansed from us. They cleansed from among us the hypocrites and cowards and those that could not endure. That was one of the reasons for persecution, to clean the church up, to get rid of those who could not stand the heat. What's the phrase? If you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. Well, many during Joseph Smith time got out of the kitchen and left the church because they couldn't stand the heat. And what was left was the noble and great ones. Brigham Young, Heber C. Kimball, Wilford Woodruff, John Taylor, etc., etc., etc. We said later, wealth will do this. Wealth will start weeding out those who cannot handle it and will let themselves get kicked out of the gospel because they just adhere to it and they're alert to it and their hearts are consumed by it. And there's so many different ways of doing that that we have to be careful. Back to President Cannon. The gospel of Jesus Christ, which brought persecutions and called upon men to forsake houses and lands and everything that was dear to them and to push them out into the wilderness, had no attraction for the classes I have named in the early history of the church. And I expect that there will be an attraction for the classes I have named in the early history of the church. And I expect that there will be attraction stronger than the gospel to hypocrites and those weak in the faith in the present phase of our history, and that influence is now operating will produce the same results as we have witnessed. That is, to cleanse the people of God. Wealth will attract all kinds of people into the gospel that are weak in the faith and lust after the things of the flesh and will be in the church and... And yes, you'll see hypocrisy in the church and you'll see all kinds of stuff. Dishonesty and financial dealing and stuff because of the lure of wealth. And some will blame the leaders of the church and they'll leave the church and kick themselves out of it and they can't stand the test and realize, no, members have brought this upon themselves. Isn't it the church's problem? It's, mem- it's a people problem. They're not converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ. My, my, my salvation is not dependent on somebody else in the ward. I don't go to church because of somebody else. I go there because I love God. I don't go there because someone else sees me there or they think good of me. I am active in the gospel of Jesus Christ because of my love for Jesus Christ. I want to follow him, regardless of what goes on at sacrament meeting. Because I love him, I want to keep his commandments. Well, we'll have people in church that won't do that. And some will judge the whole church by that and justify themselves in leaving because of that. Back to Elder Cannon, present Cannon. I do not dread the results. But present but present time but let me see. Okay, now I pray. We have, therefore, at the present time at our doors, which menaces us with great danger, with greater danger than mobs. I do not dread the results, but doubtless many, unless they are very careful, will have their hearts hardened and their eyes blinded by, and they will fall prey to and be overcome by these evils which the adversary is seeking to pour upon us. The, the evils of seeking after wealth, of their hearts set upon wealth, the evils of seeing hypocrites in the church and then justifying themselves and leaving the church because, oh, the whole church must be hypocrites. And so they, those who complain about being judged by others judge others m- more so than anybody else I know. it. That's the irony. Those who, oh, the church, people in the church are so judgmental. Like, oh, well, that's an awfully judgmental statement. See, they'll, they'll see all of this. And he's warning us, this is going to come in the church. You're going to have this. Can you withstand that kind of stuff? To heck with mobs. That's going to infiltrate the church. And can you stay in the gospel? Not worry about that. Your activity and your conversion is not dependent on somebody else and what they do. Back to President Cannon. Let's finish this quote. It has been truly said by many, introduce fashion into Salt Lake, increase wealth among the people, and induce them to follow fashion, and be surrounded by influences that will win them from their primitive habits, then you have solved the Mormon problem. There is great truth in this statement. I recognize it and warn you of it. 
I know that if we would allow ourselves to be thus influenced, there is really more danger in this than anything else. End of quote by President Cannon. That is profound prophecy. And we're living in the fulfillment of it. Can you and I handle wealth? And all the dishonesty and deceit that will come with it, even among members of the church. Yes, there are unrighteous members in the church. Yes, there are hypocrites in the church. Yes, there are those who do all kinds of things. And one of the first things I should say is, is it I? To heck with what others are. What about me? Am I part of that? But then others will use as an excuse to leave Christ and his gospel and his church. That will be their great excuse. I wonder how that's going to turn out at the judgment day. When Christ will say, look, this was between you and me. It wasn't between all these members and what you thought the church should be and how you thought it should have been perfect and this person should have done this and you got offended because of that. And then we'll realize our foolishness if we're not careful. Chapter 13, verses 7 through 8. The figure of the pasture which made Israel full, Isaiah 13, 6, is found upon the comparison of Israel to a flock, see Hosea 4, 16. The chastisement of the people is therefore represented as the tearing in pieces and devouring of the fattened flocks by wild beasts. God appears as a lion, panther, or bear, which will fall upon them, therefore giving the consequences of forgiving, forgetting God. The punishment has already begun and will still continue onward for the phrase, by the way will I observe them. In other words, I will continue to see this and I will observe and watch this. This tearing of pieces, meaning the, the destruction of the house of Israel. This devouring will be fatal for will rend the cull of their hearts. Cull of their hearts, meaning the breast, the inside means the enclosure of the heart, that is, their breast. I mean, this is, this is going to be fatal. This, this will devour the very center of their heart and, and destroy them. Chapter 13, verse 9. Or, oh, you, this should, you could translate this as, or, O oh Israel, it hurls thee into destruction that thou art against me thy help. That's a better rendition of what he's saying. Chapter 13, verses 10 through 11. Israel rebelled against Jehovah when they fell away from the house of David and made Jeroboam their king, and with contempt of Jehovah put their trust in the might of their kings of their own choosing. But these kings could not afford them any true help. The question asked in these verses, where is thy king, that he may help us, does not presuppose that Israel had no kings at all at that time, and that the kingdom was and that the kingdom was in a state of anarchy, but simply is that it had no king who could save it when the foe, the Assyrians, attacked it in all its cities. So that's what it's referring to. God in his wrath gives the sinful nation kings and takes them away. In order to punish the nation through its kings, God gave the tribes who were disconnected, I'm sorry, discontented with the theocratical government of David and Solomon, a king of their own. Remember, this is when they broke and divided. We don't like what Rehoboam's doing in the southern, that, who's the leader in and, and this government under David and Solomon, because they were being wicked and they weren't making good choices, and so they decided we're going to break from that. Okay? So God gave the tribes who were discontented with the theor theocratical government of David and Solomon a king of their own, that he might punish them for their resistance to his government, which came to light in the rebellion against Rehoboam which separated themselves from the royal house to which the promise had been given of everlasting duration and were also separated from the divinely appointed worship and altar, which were in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was in the southern kingdom, not the northern, when it divided, and given up into the power of their mostly unrighteous king. Chapter 13, verses 12 through 13. The sin of Israel is kept stored in God's remembrance and will surely bring about its own punishment. All their sins are preserved for punishment. 
Therefore, all pains overtake Ephraim like a woman in labor. The pains of childbirth are not merely a figurative representation of violent agony, but of the sufferings and calamities connected with the refining judgments of God, by which new life was to be born and a complete transformation of all things affected. He cannot be spared these pains, for he is a foolish son. Okay, Israel's going to have to go through its... We know in the millennial day it will be reborn, Israel will be gathered, and it will become righteous, like a newborn babe. Okay, but right now he's a foolish son. But in what respect is he a foolish son? This is explained in terms of giving birth. This is what these verses are talking about. Ephraim is like a foolish child that delays his own birth by staying in the passage of the womb. In other words, he has not the wisdom to rouse himself in this great crisis. See, if you stayed in the passage of the womb, it would kill you. It would kill the mother. Well, this is what Israel's doing. It doesn't have the wherewithal to realize it needs to be born. It won't repent. Even under the chastising judgment, he st still delays his conversion and will not let himself be newborn like a child, but now are in danger of being destroyed. And so that's the figure and the symbolism he's using in comparing this childbirth to Israel. And it's not willingness to be born. Chapter 13, verse 14 use, uses the figures of resurrection as a metaphor that promises the gathering and the restoration of Israel. The dry bones metaphor in Ezekiel 37, 1-14 conveys the same message. The fact that the resurrection is symbolic of the gathering of Israel does not diminish the usefulness of these passages in proving that the resurrection was a firm doctrine among the Israelites. In fact, just the opposite is true. For a metaphor of this type loses its force if the type or figure used is not real. So there really was a physical resurrection, but it's also used as a metaphor of restoration. At the end of Hosea 13, 14, the Lord says, Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. This could mean that the Lord will not sway, sw swerve in his purpose, even though Israel may cry out for deliverance. When the grave is conquered, however, and the judgment's rendered, there will be no more sin, hence no more repentance, because all will be assigned to a kingdom whose laws they can't obey. So, talking about the final judgment day and the resurrection. Chapter 13, verses 15 through 16. Ephraim in his prosperity is compared to a fertile country suddenly dried up by the east wind from the desert and the failure of water. The phrase wind of the Lord, meaning breath of the Lord, that's what wind comes from the same word meaning breath of the Lord, the wind being poetically conceived of as God's breath, just as the thunder was his voice. An east wind will come, a tempest bursting from the desert, raised by Jehovah, which will dry up his spring. That is, destroy not only the fruit of the land which God has blessed it, but all the sources of its power and stability. The Assyrians will plunder the treasure of all costly vessels, that is, all the treasures and valuables of the kingdom. Ephraim would have to bear the cruelties inflicted by a merciless foe in a barbarous age. That's why it talks about murdering the women with children. And so they do. That's a high price to pay for ignoring prophets. And it will be today, too. I think abortion is a high price those unborn children have to pay. Because women will not listen to Jehovah, God, Jesus Christ, and prophets. Gospel principle in this chapter, we are free to choose between good and evil, God and Satan. But we are not free to choose the consequences of those choices. As much as the world tries, they never will be able to choose the consequences of their choices. Chapter 14, the last chapter, Israel will surely repent and be forgiven. After the prophet has set before the sinful nation in various ways its own guilt and the punishment that awaits it through the destruction of the kingdom, he concludes his address with a call to thorough conversion to the Lord and the promise that the Lord will bestow his grace once more upon those who turn to him and will bless them abundantly. This will take place in the last days in a millennial condition. 
So the last chapter, Hosea gives out a final hope that one day in the far, far future from his time, Israel will finally mend its ways, soften its heart, heed the call, and come in to the kingdom of God through the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and gather in Israel and one day become a mighty righteous nation, which will take place in the millennium. Chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. Hosea pleads for Israel to turn to the Lord, which we know because of the restoration of the gospel will be in the last day, days under millennial conditions. Take with your words, that phrase means, go to him, prepare to confess your sins, and enter into the covenant by word and deed. See, that Israel will finally hear the message gospel, and some will come in by their words and bear testimony that, yes, I believe the gospel and the missionaries, and they come in by their word and their deeds, their righteous deeds, and they get baptized. Then God can receive them graciously. The phrase calves of our lips, meaning to present the sincere prayer of one's lips as an offering to the Lord, was as precious as the best offerings in the Mosaic law, which were young oxen or bullocks. Hence, the calves of our lips means sincere prayer of one's lips, the sincere words, my heart matches what I say. I can bear testimony in sacrament and testimony meeting, and I can have a heart that's not even converted. See, I can get up and say the right things. Bearing testimony is just a statement of fact. What's in my heart, see, is what's matter. Does my lips match my heart? That sacrifice of penance which is outwardly expressed, not in sacrifice of animals, but in confession of sin with a broken heart and contrite spirit. Israel would no longer depend upon the help either of foreign powers or of the idols, but trust in Jehovah, the helper of the fatherless. Then God would heal them and turn his judgments away from them. See, when that will happen as we gather in the millennial condition, God will finally destroy all of Israel's enemies and make them captive not Israel. We're in the midst of watching this mighty process. God, what a blessing it is to watch this miracle. Chapter 14, verses 5 through 7, do a frequent metaphor to express spiritual blessings. Israel will now grow spiritually and physically. Branches spread and olives, the emblems of fatness and fertility. Israel will grow and become great. Under his shadow, meaning Israel will not be protected, will Israel will, I'm sorry, that should be, Israel will now be protected by the great Jehovah and be revived. Hmm, didn't check that one off, did I? Chapter 14, verse 8. This verse passes, passes into a sort of dialogue between Ephraim and God. Thus you could have Ephraim says, What have I to do anymore with these idols? Meaning, I will in future have nothing more to do with them. Jehovah responds, I have answered and will regard him. Meaning, I have heard his prayers and I will answer it. Ephraim then says, I am like a green fir tree. Meaning, I am strong and prosperous. Jehovah, from me is thy fruit found. Meaning, do not in prosperity do not in prosperity once more forget that it comes from me. So when I prosper you again in the latter days of land, do not forget this time. So that's the exchange you can kind of see in verse 8. Well, gospel principle for chapter 14. God will keep his promises and covenants to Israel, and she shall be restored and prosper in the name and knowledge of the Lord. I hope you've seen this book of Hosea has so many applications to us today and parallels what the church is going through, what society is going through, which means we can learn and the same judgments are coming upon our society as came upon Israel. If we want to avoid them and escape them, then take the warning that Hosea gave and repent, turn to God, follow him, keep your covenants, and get converted in the heart and endure to the end, come what may. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and please subscribe to the channel.